And good morning! We're reading Marcel Proust. Welcome to the podcast. It's the show. I'm your host, Casey. This is the Godward Podcast. In this episode, I, a guy who played three sports in high school and listened to Two Live Crew and White Snake, am going to reflect on my recent reading of Marcel Proust's book, Swan's Way. It's the first installment of his six- or seven-part magnum opus, The Remembrance of Things Past, also known as In Search of Lost Time. It was published in the years around World War I, and it seems to me to be the last novel of that Gilded Age fin de siècle period that led up to the war. But it also manages to put one foot in the age that was coming, in the like high modern period that features, you know, Kafka and Picasso and Shostakovich or whatever. But first, I want to tell you a quick story about my life. Something personal, which is rare on this show, where we typically keep it very high-minded and transcendentally aloof. But descend with me now to the year 1993 or 1995, a little flat, squared-off town two hours north of Detroit, Saginaw, Michigan. Indulge me here for a minute. This was where I was born and raised. My mom and dad had moved to Saginaw from the other side of the state in the 1970s so that dad could coach basketball at the local college. I was born in 78, and my younger brother was born three years later. I think we were probably as happy as any family could have been in that time and place. It was almost always winter, and when it wasn't, Dad would take us to the local pool, and we'd practice our crazy dives off the diving board and throw a wet tennis ball at each other, and that was life, and it was fun. Little League and so on. My parents had been very popular in their high schools, and growing up was pretty much a breeze for me. I mean, maybe I wasn't first-tier cool or something, but I was certainly second-tier, and I was smart enough to make all of the gifted AP classes and all that stuff. I even had a girlfriend by the time I was 16. So anyway, this is what we would do. Every Sunday, Dad would wake me up as he was shaving, and I would go into the bathroom to watch him make the funny faces in the mirror to tighten his skin and listen to that scratching noise. I would shower and then reluctantly agree after some whining to put on my khakis and an uncomfortable shirt, and even to tuck it in so that I would be ready for church. Mom would leave early to be in the choir. Dad and I and my brother would slog in through the snowy parking lot to find our usual pew, about eight rows back on the right side. It was an absolutely sufficient little church holding maybe 200 people with dignified, narrow, stained glass and a backlit cross in the front. My brother and I would grudgingly mutter the words to the hymns and make a recurring joke about being in a cult whenever we had to read the words in the call-and-response prayer portion of the service. Then Mom would sing. We would often be suppressing laughter through the carols, When it was over, we shook the hand of the pastor lady, and we exited. And then Dad took us to the Italian diner that was right around the corner. Tony's, it was called. We would hustle in through the cold to the little, like, entry box way, kick off the snow from our shoes, and then enter the smoke-filled room, yes, it was the old days, with ruinous carpet and black plastic cracking booths lining a single square room with about eight tables in the middle of it. All four of the waitresses there knew us, and they would come over to our table and say, Mountain Dews, and we would all nod. Then we would start talking. Around the time I was 17 or so, we started talking about politics, you know, public interest stuff, beyond the world of sports. By then I was reading, so I started to have opinions, mostly libertarian ideas. My dad would push back. My brother would roll his eyes at me. Somewhere in there, we would order. For me, it was almost always an Italian bread grilled cheese with a side of mozzarella sticks. Then an old teacher would arrive, Mr. Stark, and he'd come over to our table and say something about basketball or about the weather and he'd make a joke 
about his own tacky clothes. Dad would ask about our sports teams, and later about girlfriends or about my car. How's it running? And then we would finish, quicker than anybody else who ever ate at Tony's, I'm convinced. Dad would throw down a tip, and we'd all get toothpicks at the counter, and then we'd go home and find Mom just changed into her comfortable Sunday afternoon clothes, usually heading back out to go grocery shopping. Okay, well, <clears throat> what is all this? We've talked a lot recently on this show about how meaning is made, whether it inheres in things objectively or whether individuals project meaning outward from the self into the world. Do authors, when they write a story like the one I just told, intend meaning, or do readers simply discover meaning? Well, I assure you this much concerning the story about my childhood that I just told, there's absolutely nothing to it of meaning. It's just what I remember. And one thing I'd like you to notice is that I tried to use a particular form of the past tense in the phrase, we would, over and over again. This is a way of describing something that happened repeatedly in the past, a way of describing habitual actions. Well, did my dad and brother go with me every single Sunday to Tony's? No, not quite. There was always, in fact, even another Tony's that we would go to once in a while, about four miles down the road, if our Tony's was too crowded. And sometimes we didn't even go to church. Maybe every six weeks or so we would just skip. And did Mr. Stark always show up and talk about the weather? Of course not. But usually, it seems like it, the way I remember it, Somebody like him showed up, some nondescript local personage whom we vaguely knew, former teachers, old friends, and so on. Once, at least, it was Mr. Stark, I remember. But this we would, this grammatical form, it's a way of painting a collective cumulative picture to give you a general impression of what life was like in a certain time and place. And most importantly, for a certain person, in this case, me, right? And that is the real meaning of a story like the one I just told. You don't learn so much from, I mean, you might learn something if you're interested, if you're some kind of like historian who's interested in what life in mid-Michigan was like in the 1990s, maybe some kind of an archivist would be interested. But really what you learn is about me, about the storyteller, and about the kinds of things that I notice, about who I am, about what I value, and so on. And this is how Swan's Way works. It is an impressionist painting. And above all, whether it's strictly true or a fiction, what you're learning about is the mind of the author who conceived it and composed it. For a long time, the story begins, I went to bed early. What a great first sentence. In that beautiful first sentence, he establishes the temporal setting of the entire work. This is the reflection or the recollection from a later point in life of the period of youth. Okay, The, the whole thing is about the things that seemed noteworthy to a 12-year-old, reported some decades later by that same 12-year-old, but who's now, you know, much older, right, grown up. It's actually fascinating to think about the process of memory. I mean, what, e what even is it, right? Like, if I ask you to tell me about something you remember from fifth grade, for example, about the year that you were 10, what can you recall? You lived it. You lived each moment of it, an entire year. So what did you retain? For me, it's incredibly mundane stuff in fifth grade. A class trip to Lansing, you know, Andrea Coates' phone number, roller skating, a certain Lou Whitaker baseball card, jumping a certain curb with my bike, a bad fishing trip with grandpa, stuff like that. But it's such a finite set of memories given that I lived through a whole year there. So it makes me wonder what things I have forgotten about fifth grade and why I remember the things that I do remember. Almost all of them seem so plain, so forgettable. So the question is, what sorting mechanism was at work within me 
sort of saying, you know, keep this in the files and discard that. As far as I can tell, I mean, I wasn't in charge of that process. <clears throat> okay, look, I promised to talk about the book, this impossible to summarize book. It's like trying to summarize a Monet painting. But, okay, I mean, that's why you're here, I suppose. The narrator in this book is unnamed, and although I rarely do this, I basically fell into just assuming that he was Proust, the author, more or less. But, strangely for a narrator protagonist, this one hardly participates in the outward action or in the plot. Well, and moreover, there hardly is any significant particular action or plot that takes place. Instead, what we get is a portrait of a family and a social circle, and of the road leading, you know, this way and that way from their estate in Cambrai. These are high quite high social status people, and the cumulative picture of them is, at least in my judgment, that they are a particular type of late civilization people. They've inherited money, they're concerned about their station, and therefore they're careful about who they associate with. But all of this is sort of merely background to the real story. In fact, I think it's an interesting question whether this particular setting is related to the more central stuff of the novel, which is the incredibly sensitive perception and introspection of the individual who narrates. I'll try to il illustrate what I mean here in a moment with an example from the book, but to give you a preview, what I'm questioning here is whether an individual must be raised in a certain comfortable phase of civilization in a certain way in order to attain or to achieve the level of perceptivity that the narrator of Swan's Way demonstrates. For instance, am I less sensitive, less perceptive, because I grew up without so much wealth, more immersed in, you know, the struggle of sort of middle-class, Rust Belt America or something, with no access to, say, a cathedral, you know, a Methodist rather than a Catholic, American rather than French, or is it only that the things the narrator from Cambrai perceived were so much more beautiful than the things I perceived in the rundown town of Saginaw, and so therefore his book is like worth writing and mine wouldn't be? I remember a particular moment, though, on the floor of my little humble living room, you know, one winter morning, the way the sunlight came in diagonal and lit it up, and those little motes of dust floating through the air, the way I clap my hands to disturb them to see what would happen. It's like I have these very uh, acute memories that I suppose I could narrate, but it's like, well, what, what even are they? Who even cares, right? Anyway, to the example from the book. In a famous early section of the novel, the narrator is reflecting on these kinds of questions. It's so well written. It's so much better done than what I'm doing here, even in translation. So let's listen to some of it. I'm going to read it. Ready? Quote, It is the same with our past. It is a waste of effort for us to try to summon it. All the exertions of our intelligence are useless. The past is hidden outside the realm of our intelligence and beyond its reach in some material object, in the sensation that this material world would give us, which we do not suspect. It depends on chance whether we encounter this object before we die or do not encounter it. I hope you understand the point here. He's sort of saying that memory is partially or even totally involuntary. We all have these crazy throwback moments once in a while. I think it's pretty common for them to be triggered by a certain scent, actually. For example, there was a big mature magnolia tree in my front yard growing up. And as a kid, you know, it was just there. It was just background noise. But one day, years later, five states away, about a month before my daughter was born, I remember going for a walk with my very pregnant wife and passing alongside one of these magnolias in bloom. And for a moment, it was, it was like I was back home, but here, everything was all connected. Everything sort of made sense in the grand scheme of things for a second, you know? But if I hadn't gone for that walk, you know, and smelled the magnolia, well then nothing. No memory of home and meaninglessness, right? So anyway, 
he continues, and in, right after what I just read to you, and he introduces his famous example of the Madelines, these little cookies. You can Google them, or maybe I'll put a picture up here. <clears throat> uh, and the narrator says, continuing from where I left off, quote, For many years already, everything about Cambrai that was not the theater and drama of my bedtime had ceased to exist for me, when one day... In, in winter, as I returned home, my mother, seeing that I was cold, suggested that, contrary to my habit, I have a little tea. I refused at first, and then, I do not know why, changed my mind. She sent for one of those squat, plump cakes called Petite Madeleine that look as, those they have been, uh, look as though they have been molded in the grooved valve of a scallop shell and soon, mechanically oppressed by the gloomy day and the prospect of another sad day to follow, I carried to my lips a spoonful of tea in which I had let soften a bit of Madeline. But at the very instant when the mouthful of tea mixed with cake crumbs touched my palate, I quivered, attentive to the extraordinary thing that was happening inside me. A delicious pleasure had invaded me, isolated me, without my having any notion as to its cause. I had immediately rendered the vicissitudes of life unimportant to me. Its disasters innocuous, its brevity illusory, acting in the same way that love acts, by filling me with a precious essence, or rather this essence was not merely inside of me, it was me. I had ceased to feel mediocre, contingent, mortal. Where could it have come to me from, this powerful joy? I sensed that it was connected to the taste of the tea and the cake, but that it went infinitely far beyond it, could not be of the same nature. Where did it come from? What did it mean? How could I grasp it? I drink a second mouthful in which I find nothing more than in the first, a third that gives me a little less than the second. It is time for me to stop. The virtue of the drink seems to be diminishing. Clearly, the truth I am seeking is not in the drink, but in me. End quote. <clears throat> if you're in the right spirit of mind to really hear all this, man, it's just perfect. It returns regular listeners of The Godward Show to our recent conversation of internal and external, the object and subject. Where exactly does meaning arise? Is it in the Madeline, or is it in me? Or is it somehow the actual combination of the, these two things, right? Well, Tonight, I was thinking about whether novels actually teach anything. Do we learn substantively when we read stories, fictions? It is a profoundly different mode of thought. I think I'm pre prepared to defend the notion that yes, it is, these are essential, and we do learn something reading them. I notice, however, that experience in narrative is almost never taken to be an authoritative credential. And perhaps this is good and necessary, I don't know. After all, I mean, we maybe wouldn't want a bunch of hippie English professors with their utopian designs running civilization. So we stick to our catechism, our orthodoxy, our philosophical prose, our scientism. Heraclitus is serious, but Homer, only entertaining. We trust our technocrats, our scientists, right? We think that Real expertise must be in quantifying things. So numbers and statistics and charts always win in a public debate about, like, what is to be done. But let me suggest, before I move on from this, that it was, for example, Dostoevsky alone, and not any of the gentlemen experts whom he addressed in Notes from the Underground, who saw clearly what troubles were coming in the 20th century. And if the Tsar had appointed Dostoevsky, this novelist, chief advisor, Russia might still be a serious people rather than a second-rate empire. But still, I understand the problem with this. The technical experts can quantify their claims. 
the Proust reader can only know himself better or something. He might see more clearly the way the backs of his own hands look, or be better able to recognize a certain cocked eyebrow look from a relative or a neighbor's aloof wave of the hand. It's really hard to say what he knows that the physicist doesn't. But I think it's something, and I do think it's essential. There's a quote, just random. This is the kind of language you get in here. Quote, and on a misty morning in autumn, one might have thought it, he's talking about the steeple of St. Hilary, rising above the stormy violet of the vineyards, a ruin of purple nearly the color of a wild vine. And man, I just dare you to describe something like that. Describe almost anything in terms that are equal to these. You'd be a genius to do it. Well, I could rave on about this book about how provocative it is, like in such an interesting and subtle way too, but this wouldn't do much for you. You, you, kind of, you do have to read it. You have to read it. And if you decide to read it, be prepared to not understand right away exactly what it is you're gaining by reading it. It's slow and subtle and dense. It moves the part of you that's the iceberg underneath the water, you know? The last thing I want to suggest is that all of this, the stuff about memory and the sensitive mind, it seems to be related in the mind of the narrator to reading. And so there's this like meta layer to what's going on here. Nothing I can say will improve on what he says. So again, just listen to half a paragraph. Quote, After this central belief, which moved incessantly during my reading from inside to outside, toward the discovery of the truth, came the emotions aroused in me by the action in which I was taking part. For those afternoons contained more dramatic events than does often an entire lifetime. These were the events taking place in the book I was reading. It is true that the people affected by them were not real, as Francois said, but all the feelings we are made to experience by the joy or the misfortune of a real person are produced in us only through the intermediary of an image of that joy or that misfortune. The ingeniousness of the first novelist consisted in understanding that the sorry that in the apparatus of our emotions, the image being the only essential element, the simplification that would consist in purely and simply abolishing real people would be a decisive improvement. A real human being remains opaque to us, presents a dead weight which our sensibility cannot lift. If a certain calamity should strike him, it is only in a small part of the total notion we have of him that we will be able to be moved by this. But the novelist's happy discovery was to have the idea of replacing these parts impenetrable to the soul by an equal quantity of immaterial parts, that is to say, parts which our soul can assimilate. What does it matter thenceforth if the actions and the emotions of this new order of creatures seems to us true, since we have made them ours, since it is within us that they occur. End quote. And then a few lines further, he concludes this thought parenthetically saying, Thus our heart changes in life, and it is the worst pain, but we know it only through reading through our imagination. I can't do better than that by Proust, but I recommend reading him. It's an experience altogether different from watching a YouTube video, an experience that would benefit almost anyone. The imagination is a muscle and a gateway, and you have to exercise it. Hey, thanks for watching the Godward Podcast. Support me on Patreon if you want to. Like, share, and subscribe. Click these other videos and increase my click-over rate so that the algorithm rewards all this hard work. You know, whatever, or not. Have a great afternoon if it's the afternoon where you are. And, uh, bye-bye. <laughs>